It's one of those nights, Clipper Nation. Everyone returned on Wednesday night. Paul George, Ivica Zubats, Norman Powell, Reggie Jackson, Kawhi Leonard was healthy. The Clippers were fully healthy and showed what they could do against the Charlotte Hornets. I was at the game. Going to be talking about it coming up on today's Locked On Finally Healthy Clippers. Let's go. Don Clippers, your daily Los Angeles Clippers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Yes, sir, you are locking in with the clips. Thank you for making Locked On Clippers the first listen of your day. Your team every day i am your host darian vaziri in my 18th season as a clipper fan and you know what i'm enjoying that season a lot more of late you can follow me on twitter and instagram at dime dropper pod and of course subscribe to my own youtube channel where you will be getting a vlog of the game i just attended tonight you'll so a happy friday to you a happy thursday to you all Just returned from the game i know i probably look exhausted for the youtube people and by the way if you are on the youtube version Please remember to subscribe if you're not and hit the notification bell so you know every single time that we upload here at Locked On Clippers. And make sure to answer today's pin question. What was your favorite part about the game tonight? Was the first half of the game the best of the season for the Clippers? Because I think the game was decided there. So I'm going to be talking about that to start. And then general things I liked about the performance on both ends. I'm going to close out with things that I didn't like because it was not a perfect game, even though the first half felt perfect in ways. So Clippers against the Charlotte Hornets in this one, the Charlotte Hornets in which they just defeated a couple of, about I want to say two weeks ago in Charlotte when Kawhi Leonard hit a game winner which obviously made me and Clipper Nation ecstatic. But in this game, you had LaMelo Ball and Gordon Hayward healthy. So that obviously changes the Charlotte Hornets a bit. And a lot of LaMelo, I don't want to say a lot, but there were a solid amount of LaMelo Ball jerseys in the crowd tonight. Just fans of his and maybe some family. And, you know, he has a bigger fan base than I thought. I mean, he is from here, Chino Hills, so makes sense. But the Charlotte Hornets, I think they just totally made life easy for the Clippers. And the starting lineup was the the expected starting lineup of Reggie, Paul, Kawhi, Marcus Morris, and Zoo. And 10 people played. The bench was John Wall, Norman Powell, Luke Kennard, Terrence Mann, and Nico Batum. So a nice little 10 man unit but i'm going to be talking about something i didn't like about that later in the episode however and i think if you've listened to this podcast enough you probably know what that is but the starting lineup just really set the tone and i think this game was basically over after the first quarter the first quarter was 37 to 19 in favor of the clippers and you could just automatically see what Kawhi leonard and paul george did on the offensive end it's kind of like everything i was just saying in the episode on wednesday's episode about what the difference that they make in terms of that offensive rating being so low and being so low for the clippers is mainly because they don't play but when they play it just it's a totally different threat out there because not only are they both just incredible isolation players especially Kawhi, they're another two another Another two great threats on pick and rolls that can handle the ball that I said all preseason and before the season that I want the ball in their hands more than Reggie Jackson, more than John Wall, more than anybody, whether it be pick and roll or isolation. And you know, one thing I've noticed about Ty so far in the games that Kawhi has played, the Clippers have run a lot less high pick and roll and more get the ball to Kawhi, whether he's coming off a screen or catch it in the mid post area, 18 feet away or something. A little more isolation ball, but it's not a bad thing because it's Kawhi Leonard. And he he gets hard double teams. He gets hard double teams. And you saw on the first play of the game tonight, or one of the earliest plays of the game, he got blitzed. And they were blitzing him a good amount when he got a high screen behind, behind the three-point line. But he didn't get too many. Overall, it's what I said. 
in my opinion, thinking back to the game tonight. Now, I will say when you're at a game, it's a little bit different than when you're watching on TV. I feel like something's going to be a blur and you're so in the moment. And you know me, I'm so intense at games and I'm so loud. Like sometimes it can, I, sometimes I go home and watch the game back. Didn't get a chance to do that tonight, but it felt like I don't remember too many high screening roles with Kawhi and Zoo. I remember mostly they were, he was get he got blitzed a couple of times when they did it, but overall it was either him coming off screens or catching the ball and isolating or a lot of small, small pick and rolls or wing, wing pick and rolls with like Marcus Morris setting the screen and popping out. And I thought those actions worked really well because the Charlotte Hornets don't have switch everything personnel. And you could see their defense was just awful. I think they may be the worst team in the league defensively. I'm not 100% sure on that, but they were atrocious. Their effort was just, I mean, just the effort was just not there. I mean, they were short Terry Rozier, who's been their leading scorer this season, but. They didn't really come to play. I think they probably had too good of a night last night. I mean, they're in L.A., I can understand. They're probably having a good time. But they just didn't come to play in, in any shape or form, way, shape, or form. The Clippers showed offensively that they were just too much. Paul George started out great, and it came so easy to him. His first three field goals, one was on a catch-and-shoot three from Kawhi Leonard, the other one off a Kawhi Leonard outlet pass. He had a wide-open layup. And then his third field goal came. Finally, he was isolation one-on-one, got an and-one jumper. So Paul George looked like he hadn't even missed a game. Kawhi Leonard makes it easier for Paul George because he gets attention and vice versa. And Kawhi Leonard gets double-teamed, straight hard doubles. And he creates for other guys, gets guys open shots. It's just beautiful when you have two stars on the court and other teams don't. And Paul George is not just another star. Paul George is used to being the best scorer on his team wherever he's been. In Indiana, in OKC, and in Los Angeles with us. He's always the best scorer except when Kawhi is on the court. And that makes it easier, in my opinion, for him. People think, oh, sometimes PG doesn't play as well with, with, with Kawhi. I think that's a narrative person. I think you could say that the first year they were together. But when Ty has come, he's found a decent balance by putting the ball in their hands and making them more of point forwards. And overall, when you go back to the only playoff run that they've been healthy together, the Clippers did not get eliminated. They made it tough for themselves, yes, but Kawhi Leonard and Paul George were both eating. And I was at game three and four against Utah, and I have vlogs of it on my channel. You can check them out or go watch the highlights, whatever you want to do. Paul George and Kawhi Leonard were cooking. They had found that rhythm in that season playing with one another because Paul George is humble at the end of the day and knows that Kawhi is that dude, but he knows that he can also be that dude. At times. But overall, Kawhi is that guy. He's the finals MVP. He's the man that brought Toronto their first ring. Averaged 30 in the playoffs. He was the man. One of the best players in the league when healthy. And so was Paul. But Kawhi, you know, there's levels to this. And he knows that. And that's what I love about him. And when you see both... But against a game, a team like the Charlotte Hornets or in a regular season game or even on a given night, Paul George can be the best player and will be the best player on the Clippers a lot. He's just that good as well. And tonight you saw the full display of just him working, and it was, it was just effortless. I don't think the Clippers really got tested in this game. It was too easy. Second quarter, 34-21 to 21 in favor of the Clippers. So second worst offensive rating in the league, dropped 71 points in this game, and the bench was awesome. Nico Batum was incredible. Incredible. Luke Kennard was awesome. Fantastic as well, doing what Luke Kennard does. Norman Powell, so good to see him back. I'm going to be talking about those guys and their performances coming up. Did you know that driving high is considered driving under the influence? That's right. Driving under the influence of marijuana is against the law in every state, even in states where marijuana is legal. That means driving high could get you a DUI. And if you think law enforcement officers can't tell when you're driving high, you're wrong. Your friends can tell. Your coworkers can tell. Even your parents can tell. Everyone can tell. So what makes you think that law enforcement officers don't know, why, don't know when you're driving high? Driving under the influence of marijuana can slow your response time and change how you perceive time and speed. So even if you think you're fine to drive when you're high, you're not. And because the bottom line is, if you feel different, you drive different. And driving high is driving under the influence. So remember, drive high, get a DUI.
paid for by NHTSA. All right. So the Clippers bench. It was fantastic, in my opinion. I thought all five of the guys, Terrence Mann, Luke Kennard, John Wall, Nico, and Norm, did their jobs. Did their jobs. We can go through each of them individually. Nico Batum, he was all over this game. He was hitting open threes, and mind you, he shot 10 shots tonight. All those shots were threes, and he made seven of them. 70% from three on 10 attempts. That is just fan, just ridiculous for a role player. And then he does so many great things on the defensive end. He can guard basically everybody on the Charlotte Hornets team. And he's a great communicator. And he just has, once every two or three games, he has a sneaky backcourt or steal on an inbounds where the other team just gets complacent and doesn't realize that Nico's got long arms. And he's going for those sneaky steals when you're not expecting it in the backcourt or on your inbounds passes. And tonight he got one of those and it led to a Reggie Jackson three. And Reggie Jackson really bought into his role tonight. I know he didn't come off the bench, but he really bought into his role tonight. And just played like a role player. I don't remember seeing him take any bad shots. He was 3 for 5. He had 10 points. 3 assists. And he only shot 5 times. And made 3 of those shots. 4 of them were 3's. And he made half of them. So that's the Reggie Jackson that the Clippers need. Catch and shoot Reggie. Just... You know... And and, and again... Ty Lue only played him 22 minutes. And that's really the key. That's really the key is Tyron Lue needs to make the see the personnel on his team and and i think eventually he'll make the right decisions because he's a very smart guy and i still trust him i know a lot of there are a lot of clipper fans most of them that really trust ty Lue. there's a small subsection doesn't really like ty Lue. thinks that he's overrated thinks he doesn't know what he's doing whatever ty Lue has made history for the clippers in his first year as coach he has shown to eventually figure it out and i think that as the season progresses and the healthier the Clippers are, he's going to realize that Reggie Jackson, as much as Clipper fans and myself, I love the guy, and as good as he's been for the Clippers, in that rotation of 11 players, the starting lineup plus Nico, Rocco, Norman Powell, John Ball, and Terrence, and Luke, even if you throw a mere coffee in there, Reggie Jackson is probably bottom two worst players in that, in my opinion. But I will say this, he's a better fit, a lot of times with Paul George and Kawhi Leonard out there because off the ball, he's just a much better shooter from deep than John Wall. Just a better shooter in general than John Wall. And I thought that John Wall was good in the first half, very good actually in the first half, but second half you start to see some problems with him. When he plays with Paul George and Kawhi, and he's off the ball, it's what I said in the last episode, his value just gets taken away big time. And he's not really a great shooter from three. So when he's spotting up for three, I mean, tonight in this game, 0 for 3. It's like, it's tough. I I just think he needs to pass up those shots. And teams are going to load up on Kawhi, and it's going to be annoying. But I still think the Clippers can still work and get a decent shot. And he can still attack closeouts in a certain way or step into the mid-range. And I'm okay with him taking the mid-range. He has to keep defenses honest. Threes are just not for everybody. You know, it is what it is. But Reggie Jackson is a great fit alongside those two. And I thought that in this game, he was really solid and stuck to what he was, stuck to what he was good at and didn't do too much. And Marcus Morris Sr. also had a very solid, efficient game. And you needed this from Sr. He also had a pretty solid defensive game, two blocks, one of which was really early in the game. And he blocked, I think it was P.J. Washington from behind. And I thought P.J. had a wide open dunk. But Senior came from behind, got all ball. Fantastic hustle play by Marcus Morris from behind. He shot seven times, made four of his shots, and was three for four from deep. One of them, he was just classic senior. Dude's just draped all over him. And he just rises up over him in the corner and hits the three. Marcus Morris and Reggie Jackson, a combined seven for 12 in this game. And a combined five for eight from deep. So when you get that kind of production from Reggie and senior, not taking too many tough shots, not doing too much, 
it is exactly what the Clippers are going to need to go all the way. And Nico Batum doing a little bit of everything. Seven rebounds as well to go along with his 21 points. The steal. Just in just the Swiss Army. I mean, I should say the French Army knife. <laughs> Uh, the way this guy just does a little bit of everything. And it sucked in the beginning of the season where you were questioning if Nico's just washed. Maybe he's a little old. Looked like he was slowing down. But good old Nico. So reliable. He has worked his way back into form. And I am just enjoying watching him play. One of my favorite Clippers. No question. In his third season with the club. And in his first season, he already has the Batum Battalion. Already helped the Clippers get to the conference finals. And he was a huge part of that series and a huge part of that game six as well. As for John Wall, I thought in the first half he did a really good job of pushing the pace, doing a good job of outletting off of stops that the Clippers were getting. And, man, the Clipper defense in this game was really good. I'm probably going to be talking about that in a, more in a second in depth. But I thought that the Clippers, I talked about, again, I keep referring to the last episode because it felt like seeing the Clippers healthy, they were just doing basically everything I said. They needed to push the pace a little bit more. And I think that when you get stops, you have the luxury to do that. And the Clippers were getting tons of stops, forcing a lot of turnovers, and doing a good job of pushing the pace when it was there. And the Hornets were cross-matched, had mismatches, just picking up the nearest guy to them. And it was all it was causing all sorts of matchup problems for them and allowing the Clippers to get all, all sorts of good looks. And... John Wall was one of the catalysts for pushing the pace, as he so often is. Two times he got right to the rim and blew by. Blew by, I don't remember who, but blew by a Charlotte Hornets player to get right to the rim. And then did a couple of nice, did a good job, I should say, of making a couple of nice outlet passes and getting the offense started quickly, finding guys up ahead for easy transition opportunities. And also some nice strips as well in the defensive end. Four points for him, two rebounds, three assists. A steal and a block. Second half, I think, you know, he missed a couple of shots, missed a couple, missed a three or two. And you saw exactly what I said, where off the ball, it's just tough. You know, when, when John Wall's on the ball, it's a lot better, but teams know that his threat is downhill, downhill. They're going to force him to shoot, and more teams are starting to make him shoot. So, I, as again, I hope he hits the mid range threes. Don't think he needs, don't think the Clippers really need them from him Terrence Mann typical day at the office for him eight points four boards played hard hit a hit two threes out of three attempts was two for five overall you know what Terrence does and then Luke Kennard and Norman Powell really the boost the Clippers needed off the bench typical Luke Kennard game shot eight threes made half of them some were deep some were semi-contested, some were wide open, some were on the move, some were off the catch to stand still. He's that guy. He's that guy. Another solid defensive performance for Luke as well. Three rebounds and three assists for him and plus 19 off the bench. And another guy that was plus 19 was also Nico Batum. 12 points for Luke Kennard in 24 minutes of play. Terrence Mann got 14 minutes, by the way, and John Wall got 19 Nico Batum, 21 points in 20 minutes is ridiculous. And then Norman Powell. It was great to see Norman Powell back after the groin injury. He had missed a couple of games, and he's picking up right where he left off. He was getting to the rim at will. They could not stop his, his classic, I was about to say his famous, his classic hard drive going right. He was getting all the way to the basket, finishing, getting to the line. And one thing Norman Powell is really good at is when he feels a little bit of contact on a little hand check, a little, a little touch on his body, he'll do a great job of just sweeping through and rising up and feeling that contact and kind of flailing a little bit. He's a foul baiter a little bit, I can't lie. But he gets to the line. And in this game, Norman Powell got to the line seven times and made six free throws. He had 14 points in his return. Great stuff. But So that's the Clipper offense, 126 points in this game. Won 126 to 105, led by as many as 30. It may have been even more than 30. Yeah, led by as many as 36. Just a just an awesome performance for the Clippers. But I will say this. There were some flaws. And I'm going to be talking about that 
and the defense and why it was so good coming up. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Do you ever wish life had an instruction manual? Navigating any of life's challenges can make you feel unsure, whether it's career change in a relationship or becoming a parent. There are all sorts of ways that you can feel alone and they have nowhere to turn and that nobody will help your problem. But that's why there's better help. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash locked on MBA. That's betterhelp, H E L P dot com slash locked on NBA. Thank you for making Locked On Clippers your first listen every day. Make sure to check out Locked On Sports today, the biggest stories around the sports world in 20 minutes or less, plus instant reactions, game recaps, and Locked On's take of the day. Locked On Sports today, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. All righty. Before I get into the negatives, let's talk about the defense. I went on for like 20 minutes talking about the offense because there was so much good stuff to get to. But defensively, well, the switch ability and versatility that Kawhi Leonard and Paul George bring to the table changes everything. Everything. Because you put Paul George on the mellow ball. That's what the Clippers did. Kawhi Leonard on Gordon Hayward. The mismatch was Kelly Oubre and Reggie Jackson. And to be honest, they went at it like maybe once or twice from my memory. And they just didn't do it again. I think the Hornets just don't play good basketball. They play low IQ basketball. Their effort level is suspect. LaMelo Ball, as great of a player as he is, and he did some really impressive things tonight. Really nice finishes, especially with the offhand. And he has a great layup package, great floater game. Great passer. He had a triple-double tonight. Wow. 25 points, 11 rebounds, 12 assists. He had seven turnovers, though. And again, he shot 13 threes. Half of his shots were threes, and he made four of them. Some of him, some of his shots were so reckless, like just coming up the court, no pass, half contested, just chuck it up there. He plays like it's a pickup game. Like, it's, it's honestly hilarious. Defensively, Kawhi Leonard and Paul George's ability to switch makes them, makes... When LaMelo Ball is getting screened by basically anybody not named Mason Plumlee, Clippers are switching basically everything. Because Reggie Jackson's okay to guard LaMelo Ball here and there. That's point guard versus point guard. It's not necessarily a mismatch, even though you can argue it is. But Reggie Jackson is not terrible defending other guards, in my opinion. I think where he really struggles is any forwards, any way that can overpower him. But when he's actually trying to move his feet, and he's... Honestly, more often than not, I don't... You can check me if I'm wrong, but Reggie Jackson does okay to me against guards. I think it's really what he struggles is people overwhelm him with size, and he just gives up sometimes. But Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, Marcus Morris switching everything, it just makes teams play isolation so much, blows up so many of their actions. Gordon Hayward was like the only guy I could think of tonight on the Hornets that was getting a lot of good looks and just missing. And I was like, man, when is Gordon Hayward going to make a shot? He was three for 12 from the field and 0 for four from three. And and those threes were pretty good looks, but the Hornets were nine for 31 from deep overall, 40% from the field. They turned the ball over 14 times. And one thing I'll say about the Clippers tonight, really active hands. You could say the same about Charlotte, but really active hands for the Clips. John Wall, Kawhi, Paul, Nico, Terrence, everybody getting their hands on a lot of balls. I would love to see the stats on deflections tonight but the clips were just active thought the effort level was really good and it really just comes down to the Kawhi Paul George defensively because Zubats is going to do a good job in drop coverage he's been doing that all season but you when when it's not Zubats being put in the pick and roll Clippers can switch basically everything in that starting lineup and Kawhi Leonard and Paul George are just guys that not a lot of guys want to go one-on-one against and it makes them play one-on-one basketball it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. And again, talking about what I said in the last episode, I sound like a broken record. 
offensively, when teams want to switch everything on the Clippers, when Kawhi is in, in the small ball lineup, he can actually dominate. You didn't see that much of that tonight, but I thought Kawhi looked good. The only thing with Kawhi is he's just struggling to get his three ball back. He was one for four from three and four for eight from two, but it's going to come. It's going to absolutely come. And I thought that all his threes looked better tonight. His legs are coming back. And Paul George just looked smooth. 25 points for Paul. I'm sorry, 22 points for Paul. Eight rebounds, eight assists. But here's the problem. On 7 of 15 shooting and 4 for 10 from deep. So really solid from Paul. 40% from three. That's fine. He was feeling it tonight. Kawhi Leonard, 5 for 12 overall. 16 points, 7 boards, 4 assists. But the one thing for the Clippers that was just ridiculous, turnovers. Against a better team, this would not have been acceptable. They would have lost. Or it would have been close. Let's put it that way. 27 turnovers and the Clippers won by 21. I have never, ever said anything like that in my life. I can promise you that. 27 turnovers. Let's go through them. Starting lineup. Kawhi only won. That's great, for how, considering how much he has the ball. And Kawhi played 31 minutes, by the way, if you're curious. And Paul George played 31 minutes as well. And they both got a little bit of rest in the fourth quarter. Although, the Hornets made a little bit of a run. Cut it down to, I want to say, like, 14? But then Luke Kennard made a three, I believe. And I was moving seats to make it 107 to 90. And after that, the Clippers, I think Paul George made a three right after that, and it was over. But I didn't think they were going to put Paul George and Kawhi back in the game. But they did around like the nine-minute mark. And they honestly needed to just to restore order for a little bit because LaMelo was starting to play well, starting to hit some shots. But they came in and restored order. 31 minutes is fine. They still got a little bit of rest. Now they're going to go on the road trip, and it's going to be tough. Philadelphia's been playing well. Joel Embiid's been playing insane. But let's, con let's stay on the, the game tonight. 27 turnovers. Kawhi, one is fine. Marcus Morris, two. Zubots too. And by the way, I didn't even mention Zubots. He, he was a little quieter because the Clippers went small a lot more. And again, I keep saying that. When Kawhi Leonard plays and Paul George plays, the Clippers are going to have much more success with the small ball. So Zoo's value is going to decrease, which is sad because he was literally our best player in the first like 15, 20 games. Four points for Zoo, eight rebounds. He was still solid though at three offensive rebounds. Two for three in 23 minutes. There was one time where he just fumbled the ball though late, which... Was it, to me is a sign of he's not been in and he's a little more nervous and just not in that rhythm. But I wouldn't say nervous, but just not in that rhythm. Zubats, yeah, two turnovers for him. Reggie Jackson, two turnovers. It's not crazy bad. Paul George, seven. That's unacceptable. A lot of it was just getting loosey goosey with the handle. So many of the Clipper players were just getting ripped, <laughs> straight up, just getting stripped. It was hilarious. Um, but not really that hilarious. Nico Batum had two. Norman Powell with three. John Wall with four. And Terrence Mann with three. And Luke Kennard with one. 27 turnovers. Wow. And, I, and the only other complaint I have is that Ty Lu played Luke Kennard, Norman Powell, and John Wall together a lot. And again, you know what I'm going to say. Too small. And I thought that the Hornets were actually having some success. They were getting to the line more. And it just, they're not as good of one-on-one -on -one defenders. And if that's your your goal is to switch everything with that backcourt, it, there's, teams are still going to find favorable matchups there, especially when Zubats is not in the game. You have Nico Batum and Marcus Morris playing alongside three guards. I just think that's no resistance. That's, your saw, that's what you saw in the beginning of the season that was hurting the Clippers. I think ties against a team like the Hornets is not going to matter, but against a better team, it will matter. Against Philly, it's going to matter. I think Ty's thinking there, though, is that, I mean, He's in a tough situation. Like Robert Covington only played in garbage time tonight, three minutes. And Amir Coffey, three minutes. But it's a tough choice because you don't want to sit Luke Kennard. Like you straight up don't want to sit Luke Kennard. And especially now when you see him playing a little bit of point guard and he played a little bit of it tonight and the Clippers offense still looks good. Like Luke Kennard's going to get blitzed a lot of times at the top and that's going to cause four on three situations on pick, uh, off that first pass. And... Obviously, his shooting ability doesn't, you know, goes without saying. And defensively, he's held his own a lot better than a lot of players this season on the team. So you can't sit him. Norman Powell is playing the best basketball of his season the last, like, I want to say 10 games that he's played. And then John Wall, 
is probably a better player than the starting point guard, but he's not a better fit alongside Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. Again, look, see, now I sound like I was initially right in the summer when it was like, as much as I like John Wall, did the Clippers need him? Did the Clippers, it just feels like too many cooks in the kitchen. However, I think John Wall is better than Reggie, and I still think that John's going to make a huge impact this season. But it's, it's like when everyone's healthy, it's tough. Because I truly believe that Robert Covington has a place in this rotation. I truly do. I think Reggie Jackson, out of those 11 players, is the least good. I don't want to say worst because they're all so great. Least good. Because when his shot's not falling, he's just not very effective. Tonight's shot was falling, and he was fairly effective. Not a nice floater, too. But, again, he's a better fit alongside Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. So it's tough to take Reggie out. And plus, he's Reggie Jackson. And he's done so much for the Clippers. And you just don't want to kill his confidence. So Ty has decisions to make down the line. Doesn't need to make them now. But one thing I'm just a fan of is bigger lineups. Why do I say it that way? And he might say differently. Because he wants those guys are all have a case to play. Norman Powell, Luke Kennard, and, and John Wall. I just think at the same time, I'm looking at it from a defense first lens. I'm always defense first. Not maybe, not, I don't know if everybody's like that. And right now, the Clippers have a good defense statistically. So it makes sense that he's thinking about it offensively. So that's his side of things, probably, or the coaching staff side of things. But I'm never a fan of three guys under 6'4 or 6'5 six, six, and under. And then you have no center. I just, I'm not a huge fan of that. That's not switch everything personnel to me. That, that's not good small ball defensively. Against high level competition, it's not going to work. But we'll see how it goes against Philly. I do have two tidbits of great news tonight. One, this was the fifth sellout of the season for the Clippers. I knew when I walked when I walked into my seats and this, you know, the national anthem was being sung, I said it, it's more packed tonight than almost all the other regular season games I've been to this season, but likely will be like 90% attendance under a sellout. Just checked. Official attendance report on ESPN, 100%. That's the fifth game for the Clippers this season. Lakers, Suns, Celtics, the Jazz game, which was one of the three games that Kawhi played in a row, and this one. Moral of the story, Kawhi Leonard puts butts in seats, and winning puts butts in seats, especially in this city. And when Kawhi Leonard and the Clippers are when Kawhi Leonard is playing, and that was the second thing. Just still seeing Kawhi Leonard play live in a Clipper uniform is still surreal. You know, I was in college in 2019-20, my senior year of college, so I only saw him play twice live for the Clips that year when I was in winter break, and then I saw all the playoff games, even the one he got hurt. But that's like eight games maybe? Four against Dallas, Two against Utah, which is six, and then two, yeah, eight games. So until this season, I'd only seen him play eight games with the Clippers live. So it's still very surreal for me. And I still think I'm not the only Clipper fan that must feel that way, seeing Kawhi on the court because of how much he's, time he's missed. Just seeing him is like, wow, like this guy is really a Clipper. Like, oh my God, it's just such a different feeling when he's playing and when, when him, him and Paul are playing. And moral of the story is Clipper Nation, we're back. And we just got to hope this continues. Philly next. The road trip is next. Before we close out, I am going to be definitely having to fill everybody in on that road trip. But the Clippers, 19-14 and 14 after this 126-105 to 105 win at the sold-out Staples Center or Crypto.com Arena, whatever you want to call it. But the Clippers have an East Coast road trip coming up. And it is a doozy. Five-game roadie starting on Friday with our old friend Glenn Rivers and crew. Philadelphia playing some good basketball right now. Joel Embiid, as I mentioned earlier, is killing. They've also won six games in a row. So that's not going to be an easy game. They now stand at 18 and 12. Clippers at 19 and 14. So not that far apart. That'll be a tough one. And then at Detroit, who have been abysmal this season, and Cade, a very young team, and Cade Cunningham, their number one overall pick last season, is out for the entire season. So that has to be a win. That's on Monday the 26th. That's a back-to-back. -back. I think they should sit Kawhi Leonard in that one. And then at Toronto, I think Kawhi Leonard should absolutely play, especially for how much those tickets are going to be for those fans in Toronto. He absolutely should play in that game. And that's the game that the Clippers should designate him to play. And that will be a tough one. Even though they've been in a slump, 
They just got to win on Wednesday night. It could be a momentum-changing win. And then at Boston on the Thursday, the 29th, is going to be a battle, especially considering the Celtics have Robert Williams back and they lost to the Clippers. So that will be extremely tough. And then at Indiana, who's been playing decent basketball on New Year's Eve. So five-game road trip. If the Clippers can get three wins, I'll be happy. If they can go over 500 on this trip, that would be great. Two and three will be not the end of the world. One and four would be bad. One and four, oh and five would be bad. Not me, oh and five. They're going to get a win. But we'll see. The age-old proverb is go Clippers. And tonight I say that proudly and with a smile on my face. Make sure to subscribe to Locked On Clippers and answer today's pin question. What was your favorite part? What was your favorite part about the win? And then follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, Dime Dropper, where you'll see a vlog of the game. Shout out to everybody who came up and showed love tonight at the game. It was a great time on Wednesday night. Back again for the Sixers. Go Clippers.